Um, I've written books about um, Harriet Tubman. It is her 200th birthday uh, this month and next month. We know that she was born late February or early March 1822. And so we're celebrating that at the national parks around the country. And um, uh, there's so many things going on celebrating her amazing life. And I wrote a book about uh, Mary Surratt, who was a slave-holding woman in Washington, D.C., who worked with John Wilkes Booth, aided him in his plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln, and she was hanged for her role in helping him. She was wicked, I'll just tell you that. Um, and I wrote a book about Rosemary Kennedy, the Kennedy daughter who was intellectually disabled, and um, I may have come here to talk about Rosemary. I don't remember. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. 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 And so this is my latest book, uh, Walk With Me, a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer, a famous civil rights activist from the 1960s. And she, I, I decided to write a biography of Fannie Lou. She's actually fairly famous. Um, but there was something about her that I have... Uh, I, I learned about her back in the 1990s when I went to graduate school to get my degree in women's history and African American history, advanced, and went on to get my PhD. And there was just something about her that stuck with me. But I did my dissertation on Tubman, did the book, and then I did my other books, and she was always in the back of my mind. And then in 2015, after Rosemary came out, Fannie Lou Hamer was like, knocking harder on my brain and uh, so I decided to start researching her life. Little did I know how incredible her life was and and well I'll just say it. the politics of her life are so similar today. I, you know 10 years ago I wouldn't have felt that but now and you'll see when I talk about what she went through and what she fought for the same things that are still in some ways happening today. So, Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, I need my advancer thing here. Hold on. Okay, let's see if that works. There we go. Fannie Lou Hamer was born in Mississippi October of 1917. She was the 20th child of sharecroppers Jim and Ella Townsend. She was their last child, and the survival rate for black children in the Mississippi Delta at the time was one out of four or five would die by the time they were five years old. When she was born in 1917, seven of her siblings had already died, including four babies in the four years before she was born. So Hamer, uh, Fannie Lou Townsend was a favorite of her mother's, and you can imagine why. After her mother, Ella, had lost so many babies, and then she had this one that survived. So she was very special. Um, the family picked cotton, cotton, cotton. They were sharecroppers. And um, it was a very difficult life, being sharecroppers, particularly in Mississippi. And so um, she survived grew up, um, raised, you know, in this very tight-knit family. Her father, although they were sharecroppers, her father was also a part-time Baptist minister. So their household was run sort of with his heavy hand as well as his deep faith. And her mother was deeply faithful too. So Fannie Lou Hamer was raised in this very religious household and on those cotton fields in the Mississippi Delta. They moved to uh, Ruleville in Sunflower County um, about 18, uh, 1922 and um, started sharecropping with other uh, relatives on um, a plantation there outside of Ruleville. <clears throat> and, you, and as a child, she started picking cotton at the age of six. And she picked enough to just bring pennies in for the family, but it made a difference. She went on to, um, she was in schools, schools for black children at the time. So Mississippi would spend maybe a dollar out of the hundred dollars they would spend for white schools. It was, 
they barely supported black schools. And the black schools were generally open only three or four months of the year. So the children would get back into the fields and pick and, and you know, part of the seasonal work. So when she was um, 12 years old, she left school. She had a sixth grade education. She left school to pick cotton full time to help support her family. Her older siblings moved on. Some moved to the north, out west, to the east. Some stayed there in the Delta and started raising their own families as sharecroppers. Um, so as they left, that left Fannie Lou Hamer at home, Fannie Lou Townsend at home with her parents taking care of them as they aged. At the dawn of the, uh, the Great Depression, she, you know, 1929, 1930, she left school. Her mother got injured in the field. Something flew into her eye and she ended up going blind because she did not have access to health care. Um, health resources for black families, poor families was really non-existent. Couldn't afford it. And a lot of hospitals were segregated and many doctors wouldn't even treat black patients. So Fannie Lou's mother goes blind and her father is aging. The Great Depression hits hard in the Delta. And, you know, they're scrabbling, try, scrambling, trying to feed themselves in the wintertime. And um, Fannie Lou Hamer talks about her mother would just gather up greens she'd find in the fields and mix them with a tiny bit of flour and some grease, and that would be their meal. It was a very difficult existence. Food insecurity, housing insecurity, it was cold. They didn't have resources to keep their cabins warm. The children didn't have adequate clothing. She talked about her mother tying cardboard around their feet so that they could walk to school because they didn't have shoes. Um, and so in the school houses, you know, were drafty and cold and the children were hungry. It's difficult to learn in that kind of environment. But she did learn and she was a very, very talented young child, a quick learner. She was the pride of her family and the community. She had a beautiful voice even as a small child. And at church on Sundays, she, you know, after the services were over, she would be put up on a table and sing for everybody. And she was quite a character. She was also a little bit troublesome at home because she was spoiled. Her older siblings complained that she never got punished and she was naughty a lot. And her, one of her sisters in particular resented it and how she would, you know, the father would come running, I'm going to get her, I'm going to get her. And Ella would say, don't you touch that girl, don't you touch that girl. <laughs> so she got away with a lot, but she was a very talented, bright young child. And as I said, she got through the sixth grade and that was it. Now, Fannie Lou Hamer and her family lived in the Delta about six miles from the place that they credit with the birth of the Delta Blues. So not only did she have this beautiful singing voice, but it was developed in the church, but in those fields with the call and response, the, the work songs, and the blues. Now, a lot of people had juke houses in their cabins in the Delta, and there were lots of people making bootleg liquor. Uh, Mississippi had been a dry state way before Prohibition, and it stayed a dry state after Prohibition, so everybody was making a little on the side, including her father, the Baptist minister. He must have just looked the other way. And um, so that music was everywhere. And that blues, of course, is influenced from those field songs and those spirituals and those gospel songs. And so and she absorbed it all. So when, if you go online, you can, you know, go to YouTube or have someone find and find her singing. And you can hear that touch of blues, that church music, that those field songs, that call and response. When she would get in front of an audience, she would get people going and they'd be shouting back and forth to her. It's, it's remarkable. So, um, so these pictures represent her great singing and the Delta Blues that was born six miles from where she lived. So she makes it through the Great Depression with her parents. They live next door to other family members, so they managed to survive. And um, in, in 1939, she married a local guy by the name of um, Charlie Gray. Um, I, I, I don't have any information about their marriage, except that it fell apart and they divorced in, in 1943, and he went off to fight in World War II. 
um, he complained that she had taken up with another man. Well, the other man was Perry Hamer, Pap Hamer, and this is a picture of him. He's cooking some cracklins in their backyard in Ruleville. And um, so they fell in love, and they got married in 1944. And Perry, Pap, lived on a neighboring plantation, and he had a better job. He was a sharecropper, but he also was a mechanic, and he could repair the tractors and the trucks, which gave him more money and a little bit more status. So they had a, a more comfortable cabin, and their lives were a little bit better than some of their neighbors. And um, they adopted two little girls, uh, Dorothy and Virgie. Uh, one was the child of a relative of uh, Fanny Lou's. And Dorothy, I'm not quite clear where Dorothy came from, but she was orphaned or her parents couldn't take care of her, so they started raising these two girls. Now, in Mississippi, the violence, the segregation, the discrimination was just about the worst in the country. Mississippi has the terrible reputation of having the most lynchings of any state in the country. Um, and so it was a, uh, the Klan was there, the White Citizens Council, which was a, a group of, well, they viewed themselves as a more respectable Klan because they were more out in the open, they didn't wear hoods. But it was a, there were lots of murders and um, violence uh, perpetrated against black people who stood up and asked for their rights. Um, in Mississippi, half the population was black. Less than 5% in the 1940s could vote because they had these onerous tests that you had to take, literacy tests. Um, illiterate white people could pass the test because the clerk of the court would decide who passed and who didn't. So black people were never allowed to pass, basically. So it was a violent place, but it was also a vibrant place with this music and this world that Fannie Lou and her husband, Pap, and her family, they loved their home in Mississippi, even though they struggled. So the modern civil rights movement had been percolate, percolating, well, since forever, but it really started taking off in the 1940s when soldiers, black soldiers, came back from World War two and they had been fighting for freedom around the world and they come home and they're told they can't go to that lunch counter, they can't go to that bathroom, they can't vote. And so there was some action that was happening. There was a reaction to by white people, but the action started. And by the 1950s, things really started to happen. There was the uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court. There, this is the photograph on your left um, with Thurgood Marshall that demanded that, that segregated schools be desegregated. That's actually when the Citizens Council was formed to fight that decision in Mississippi and other southern states. So that was 1954. 1955, Emmett Till, 14-year-old Emmett Till, was tortured and murdered in Mississippi, and his mother insisted that his casket be open, and the photographs were splashed across the country and people were stunned. All, many Americans around the country were like, what is going on in Mississippi? What, you know, they, it was shocking to people. And so that was in August, and then in December of 1955, Rosa Parks chose that moment to test um, the segregation laws on city buses in Montgomery, Alabama, and she sat down and would not get up and was arrested. And that started the year-long Montgomery bus boycott and the rise of Martin Luther King Jr. And, so, and that lasted a whole year. So these things are happening in Mississippi and other southern states. And Hamer is noticing. Um, in 1957, you have Little Rock Nine, the desegregation of schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. President Eisenhower had to send in the National Guard because they refused to desegregate the schools. Then, in, the 19, in 1960, young students, primarily from the North, but some from the South as well, decided that they were going to take action. The, um, the government had started to pass laws about forcing the desegregation of public facilities, so these students would go and sit at lunch counters that were segregated. And um, the nation started watching more and more. The lead up to this, 
there are more and more people in the country that before, particularly in the North, and mostly white people, could ignore what was happening down in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and Texas. But they couldn't ignore it anymore. It was in the national news. 1960, 61, the Freedom Rides. Groups of young people would get on buses. The government had passed a law and the courts had approved that interstate buses, buses that travel from one state to another, had to be uh, desegregated. They could not segregate passengers. And the bus terminal facilities had to be desegregated. They couldn't have separate lunch counters. They couldn't have separate bathrooms. So here's John Lewis, the, <clears throat> the famous congressman. And, and their buses that they were riding, this one was bombed and set on fire. They were beaten up in bus terminals. Um, it was it was a very frightening time, but it's you can see it's rapidly getting more and more things are happening. And at this time, um, Fannie Lou Hamer was struggling at home with what was going on around her, trying to raise these two girls, and she's trying to have a baby with Pap. Her mother had 20 children. She wanted to have children of her own with Pap. She had um, several miscarriages apparently two stillbirths, and she was struggling and, and suffering from fibroid tumors. And um, so on the Marlowe plantation where she and Pap worked, Mrs. Marlowe and the, you know, the owner's wife suggested that Fannie Lou go to a local doctor and have the fibroid tumors removed and that would help with her fertility. So she went to Dr. Charles Doro there in Ruleville, Mississippi. He said he could take care of it. Well, he took care of it. He gave her a hysterectomy. He sterilized her. And he did not tell her either. She found out when she was home, the cook at the plantation overheard Mrs. Marlowe telling a friend of hers how Dr. Doro had sterilized Fannie Lou. When she heard that, she was devastated, as you can imagine, and she went into a deep depression. And the only thing that helped her come out of it was her powerful, powerful faith. She turned to God and she's like, basically, what the heck? What are you doing here? <laughs> you know? And she didn't want to have hate and she was getting to that point where she had hate. And she knew that hate was bad because of what was going on around her with white people and all that hate. So she felt, you know, she just turned to God to, to pick her up. And so, I looked at that as a, as a turning point for Fannie Lou Hamer and a rebirth. She was reborn. Just as this civil rights movement is really starting to take off in the country. Now Fannie Lou used to go on lecture circuits afterwards and say she had no idea about anything about civil rights until 1962. That isn't true. I don't know why she told that to audiences, but she was active in civil rights in Mississippi secretly. It sort of had to be secret in Mississippi um, locally because you could lose your job and all that sort of thing. She used to try to get uh, NAACP memberships. She'd, do, she'd go to these big rallies that were like barbecues, four-day barbecues, but what was really going on behind the scenes was civil rights work, and she was doing that work. But it wasn't getting very far. No one, you know, the, the, the numbers of African Americans in Mississippi able to vote wasn't changing. So um, that was frustrating for her. So in 1962, um, this group of civil rights activists, young people from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, it was an, an activist group for young students, young people. It was founded and established by Ella Baker a magnificent, incredible African-American woman who worked with Martin Luther King at this Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference. And when she watched those kids doing the lunch counter sit-ins and having hot coffee and mustard and poured all over them and then beaten up and stuff, she t paid attention. And then when they did the Freedom Ride, she's like, I have to marshal the energy of these young people. They are doing so much. So she established the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They called it SNCC. And a young man, Robert Paris Moses, Bob Moses, who had been educated at Harvard, was a math teacher in New York City, was also paying attention to the news, and he decided he would go and join and work with Ella Baker. And in 1961, she sent him to Mississippi 
one of the worst states in the South in the country and said, let's, you go there and talk to the people and figure out what do they need, what do they want. That was the mission of SNCC. They weren't going to go in and tell people what to do. They wanted to know what people in local communities needed and wanted, and that's what SNCC was going to do. So they arrived in Ruleville, Mississippi in August of 1962 and had a meeting at William Chapel where Hamer went to church. And when she heard about the meeting, she decided she would go, knowing that the Klan and the Citizens Council would be watching and taking names. But she went, and at that meeting, she was transformed. She saw these young people up on stage, fearless, saying they would do anything the local community wanted them to do. What did they want? And the young people suggested, you know, let's, let's try, if, does anyone want to go try to register to vote? We'll take you. We'll help, you know, try to pass the test. Fannie Lou Hamer raised her hand, she and 17 others. They said, yes, we'll, we want to register to vote. Fannie Lou Hamer knew she was risking a lot by doing that. But they took them on a bus to the Indianola, the, the capital of um, Sunflower County, and the 18 of them took the test. Of course, they all flunked. And they were harassed on the bus on the way home. The police stopped them, arrested the bus driver for driving a bus, the wrong color yellow. It was just, the harassment was tremendous. Finally, she gets home that night, and Mr. Marlow, the plantation owner, evicted her. And said, we're not ready for that in Mississippi. So then she decided <clears throat> to join SNCC. Now she was 20 years older than the SNCC workers, but they recognized immediately that she was a leader in the community. Even though she didn't really know that, they knew it. And they started nurturing her leadership skills. So this is just a picture of a guy by the name of Theron Lind. He was the clerk, uh, court clerk in um, Forest County nearby. And he was notorious for rejecting black applicants. So much so that he was, the federal government filed suit against him over and over and over again because he was doing it illegally, and he didn't care. He just was like, they're not voting. Oh, it was just unbelievable. So Fannie Lou Hamer joins SNCC, and they start training her. They send her um, around, and they have rallies in Mississippi, and she sings. She doesn't speak a lot at first, but she does a lot of singing. And um, at the Smithsonian, they have tapes of some of these rallies, like in Indianola and other, you know, Cleveland and other places in Mississippi, Drew, Mississippi. And um, you hear all the men get up on stage and they talk, and some of them are really boring. Others are pretty good speakers. But then Fannie Lou Hamer gets on the stage and the audiences start going wild. She really gets people going. And so she's watching, and she's like, okay, how come all these men are talking? And I just have to do the singing. So she determined, and she was, you know, that much older. She's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing things. Now, in Mississippi, there was a, a middle-class black community, um, and they were act many of them were active in civil rights. But many of the men were prejudiced against Fannie Lou Hamer because she was a sharecropper. She was lower class, didn't have much of an education. So the sexism at the time, as it was across the country for every woman, was pretty palpable for Fannie Lou Hamer. But, you know, she had been reborn. She wasn't going to put up with that anymore. She, you know, was going to keep doing it. So SNCC sent her to classes in uh, Memphis and in uh, South Carolina and Georgia to learn um, uh, techniques to help people pass the test. Eventually she passed the test, by the way. And then also to learn nonviolent protest techniques, etc. And um, her leadership skills really were beginning to blossom. People, the young people were so impressed by her, they would just be mesmerized when she would get up and start talking to them during these classes. So there was a group of them that went to South Carolina in uh, June of May of uh, 1963 to take these classes. And along the bus ride to South Carolina, they decided that they would make sure that the interstate uh, bus terminal desegregation laws were intact and were being practiced. So all the way there, they went into the restrooms, the cafes, they sat wherever they wanted. They didn't have any problems. 
They did the same thing coming back until they hit Staley's Cafe at a bus stop in Winona, Mississippi. And they tried to integrate the restaurant and the bathrooms, and the police came and arrested them. They were thrown in jail, and um, she was, Hamer was, again, 20 years older than most of the people arrested. On the left is June Johnson. She was 15 years old. So I'm thinking, these parents were so brave to let their 15-year-old start doing civil rights work. And they, she wasn't the only 14, 15, 16-year-old doing this work. Um, and this is Anel Ponder. She was a, and actually she was a little bit older than most of the SNCC workers. She was a teacher from Atlanta, Georgia. And they were on the bus with several others, and they were arrested and brought to the Winona County Jail, where, for four days, they were brutally beaten and tortured. Hamer was sexually assaulted. It was another moment where she almost died from the beating. And um, when she was in the jail, she was in uh, a jail cell with another SNCC worker, Yvester Simpson. And she asked Yvester to sing with her because she was afraid she was going to die. So she sang the, the gospel, Walk With Me, Jesus. And so that's where I get the title of the book because it helped her survive. She didn't want to pass out. She, she just felt she needed to stay alive. So four days later, the, um, after SNCC offices and um, uh, Martin Luther King's office in, in, in um, Alabama, they're trying to find them because they didn't know where they had been arrested and where they had been taken. They finally find them, bail them out of jail, and it was just hours after Medgar Evers had been assassinated in Mississippi. So the violence is really gearing up a lot. There's a resistance. The movement is making a difference, but the white response is dramatic and, and awful. That Later that summer, Martin Luther King has his uh, March on Washington, and that's followed by the bombing of the church in, um, in Alabama and the four little girls that are murdered. So... You've got to understand this, this risk that everyone is taking, Fannie Lou Hamer's taking, everyone's taking, to continue this work because these white supremacists are determined and they're going to try to stop all the civil rights movement. So Fannie Lou comes up, heals from her beating. She's, she's very, very hurt. She's, her kidneys are permanently damaged. Her left eye is permanently damaged. But she's so determined now. This is, this is it. So she actually said to a reporter, they've been trying to kill me all my life. What difference does it make now? I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we get the right to vote. So she and SNCC workers start this uh, Freedom Party, the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party, as an alternative to the all-white Mississippi Democratic Party that ruled the state. And um, since they couldn't really vote, they had mock um, uh, elections where uh, people could come and vote, and here's a ballot box, so that they could prove to the world that, yes, African Americans wanted to vote because the white Mississippians and other white Southerners are saying, black people aren't interested in voting. Don't pay attention to that. They really don't want to. You know, of course they wanted to. So this was something they felt they had to do to prove that everyone wanted to vote. So Hamer was one of the founders of this Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And... With the help of the NAACP and other civil rights organizations, they teamed up and brought young people to Mississippi in the summer of 1964 called Freedom Summer. They brought 800 students from around the country, like from Boston, Harvard, and Wellesley, and, and from schools in New York, and California, and University of Michigan, and Yale, and all these schools. And they brought them down to Mississippi to go out into the communities and build community centers, established freedom schools, libraries, because libraries were segregated too. Black people couldn't go into libraries. I mean, I have no words. <laughs> so, um, and they would go around and encourage people to register to vote. And so um, it was a, a, a big success in the summer because they brought a lot of um, hope and and they established these freedom schools. So children and adults were going to these schools in the summertime. And they were helping with food, and they were bringing in clothing and food from around the country. 
it was making a huge difference. But the reaction was horrific. Three of those work Freedom Summer workers were murdered pretty quickly early in the summer. Mickey Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney, who was a local 18-year-old uh, um, young man. And they were murdered by the Klan and buried in an earthen dam. They were missing for six weeks. And finally they were found. So that summer, Fannie Lou Hamer and other civil rights activists, native-born Mississippians that were in charge of this movement, um, decided to have precinct meetings and vote for uh, delegates to go to the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City that summer. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was hoping to be nominated as the Democratic candidate at that time, and the all-white Mississippi uh, Democratic Party would not allow African Americans into their precinct meetings to elect delegates to go to the uh, convention. So the Freedom Democratic Party had their precinct meetings and their delegation meetings, and they elected, elected 68 delegates to go to Atlantic City, including Fannie Lou Hamer. So she arrives there, and it's a big to-do. The Mississippi All-White Party is furious. And they, the Freedom Democratic Party petitions the Credentials Committee and says, you have to let us sit on the floor and vote, because the All-White Party does not represent all of Mississippi. We represent all of Mississippi. And there were some white people that were on the delegation, too. So they had to petition in front of this credentials committee. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke. Other civil rights activists from Mississippi spoke. Rita Schwerner, the wife of Mickey Schwerner, who had been murdered, spoke. And Lyndon Johnson is back in, in Washington, D.C., watching the proceedings. NBC News aired it live on TV all day. So it comes time for Fannie Lou Hamer to speak. and. Johnson is a little nervous because he had heard she might be quite effective. So she starts talking, and you can see this online, portions of it online, because NBC News, sadly, sold all their archival material to, like, Bettman Archive or something, so now it costs thousands of dollars to view this. Um, the American Experience, PBS American Experience, has clips of this online so you can see it, but I encourage you to go and look so you can hear her voice and you can see her and you can they pan the audience and you can see the audience reaction. She is so powerful that the packed room, people are crying from what she's saying and they're stunned. And Lyndon Johnson is back at the White House and he's going, oh no. He needed the white delegates to vote for him because if they didn't, they were going to help George Wallace start a third party. We all remember George Wallace, lovely man, not. Um, and they were going to defect, and they were threatening him. All he wanted to do was get elected to be president so that he could pass civil rights legislation. In July of 1964, he passed one the first of civil rights le legislation. And what he really wanted to do was pass a voting rights law that is slowly being chipped away today, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. He wanted to pass that, but he needed to be elected president. And he couldn't sit, seat this upstart Freedom Party. He had to stick with the white delegates. So he sees her speaking, and he's like, oh, no, oh, my God, she's unbelievable. So he calls a press conference right in the middle of her speech. So NBC News, you can see it on, on YouTube. They pull away. Oh, we have to go to the president. He has something to say. They go to the podium in the White House, and he stands up, and he goes, I want to remind everybody that nine months ago and six days, President John F. Kennedy was shot and killed in Dallas. And he says a few words, and then he says, thank you very much, and he leaves the podium. They go back, NBC News goes back to the, the, the convention in Atlantic City, and Hamer has just finished her speech. So, so Johnson thinks, phew, I, I, I dodged that one. But she, her voice was so powerful, her story was so powerful, 
that NBC News replayed the whole thing on the news that night. So all of America watched it. And thousands of telegrams started flooding congressmen, flooding Atlantic City, the White House. Like, what the heck is going on here? So she said, I just want to read a portion, a portion of what she said. Her call, and if you hear it, she has that, that ability, like a, a really good minister. She, she has this cadence to her voice and her sentences, and it goes low and then high, and she gets choked up, and you just feel the audience. You'll feel it yourself just so powerful. So she says, and if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily? Because we want to live as decent human beings in America? She, you know, she's shouting that, telling people what's happening, the violence that's going on in her neighborhood. People are shooting into her house. So um, her voice was powerful. Of course, uh, oops, that's not the thing. Um, all these people were rallying throughout the convention to get the Freedom Party seated on the floor of the convention to vote. Here's um, part of the crowd. They're there. There's a picture of Nikki Schwerner who had been killed. The bodies were found three weeks before the convention. Um, the young men's car had been torched and it was found near a swamp. They towed it all the way to Atlantic City and they put it in a park for everybody to see so that they could not deny the violence that was happening against people who were fighting for civil rights. There's Hamer in the morning. She's with uh, Schwerner's parents right there. Uh, here she is on the convention floor. There were people that were sympathetic to the Freedom Party and they gave them their, their uh, delegation uh, passes to get on the floor and they sat in Mississippi seats and they had to be hauled out and it was very dramatic. Here's Hamer with uh, Bob Moses. Now Hamer was uncompromising. She said we're all getting seated or we're going home. Johnson and his vice president Humphrey negotiated two seats for them and while the rest of the delegation, many of them said, okay, let's take that, that's better than nothing. She's like, oh no, I want it all, or I don't want anything. So they only got the two uh, seats at large, so Hamer went home empty-handed. That was part of her being, that was part of her leadership, that was who she was. It was also part of, she was naive, that in politics you have to compromise for the greater good. And, you know, she fought and thank goodness she put her foot down because it forced everyone to continue to pay attention. But it, uh, because she did not negotiate ever, um, she suffered a lot of setbacks. She did run for Congress in Mississippi. Of course she wasn't elected because black people couldn't vote. but. She used that opportunity to contest the seating of the white congressmen that were elected in Mississippi that year. And she and her fellow, uh, the women here that, that also ran for seats in Congress, uh, they went to Capitol Hill and they demanded that the Mississippi delegation not be seated. And it was tabled till the following fall where they had a vote on the House floor about whether Hamer and her colleagues would be seated, or the elected uh, officials from Mississippi would be, or the, from the all-white party would be seated. Of course, the all-white party congressman got seated, but it was a historic moment because bringing Hamer and the other women onto the House floor, it was the first time in American history that African-American women had been able to sit on the floor of the U.S. Congress. And this is 1965. She did know Martin Luther King. They worked briefly together. This is a march against fear through Mississippi. They didn't get along very well. Um, King could not relate to Hamer. He and she could not relate to him. She wanted him to fight harder and relate to, to people like her better. He was, he was well educated. He was a leader up here. He was not a grassroots guy like she was. So there was a lot of tension between the two of them. And a lot of his allies, like uh, Ralph Abernathy and other um, 
powerful black civil rights activists, male activists, they shunned Hamer a lot. They complained about her speech. Uh, she had that thick Mississippi drawl, and it was, uh, they viewed her as uneducated. Uh, they didn't like the way she dressed. They didn't like her clothes. They were cheap clothing. As a matter of fact, she had to borrow the clothes that she, used, she wore to the convention. The purse, the shoes, she borrowed it all from a friend who had nicer clothes than she did. So there was tension there, but she knew how to draw a crowd. And you think Martin Luther King could draw a crowd. He could, but boy, she could draw them. And she was so direct and powerful. People wanted to follow her. So all of her work did pay off because in 1968, the Democratic Convention in Chicago voted to seat the Freedom Party, or in what it had become, they renamed it. And she received a standing ovation at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. The white delegation was kicked out and sent home. Now the white delegation back in, the, in 64, they actually went home too. They were so ticked off that Johnson had given the Freedom Party two seats at large that they left the convention, didn't vote, they all went home, and they ended up personally voting for Barry Goldwater, who was the racist uh, nominee for the Republican Party at the time. And, um, and by 68, George Wallace was rising up from, you know, whatever he was rising from, and they all were following him. So, but anyway, she made a difference, and she made a huge difference in the Democratic Party because she demanded that they change the bylaws, that all delegations going forward would be integrated, and if they weren't, they could not sit on the convention floor ever. Um, also, that more women should have representation, not just uh, diversity by race, but women should be have larger roles. And then she demanded that the platform start including issues like food insecurity, housing insecurity, universal health care, uh, preschool education, et cetera, et cetera. All these things we're sort of still fighting for today. <laughs> she was there, come on, Democratic Party, you've got to do all these things. Um, she was against the Vietnam War. Here she is out in Lafayette Park in front of the White House singing at a rally against the war. Um, she sang with some of the most famous people of the 1960s, like Bob Dylan, Peter, Paul, and Mary, um, Howlin' uh, Wolf, what's his name, sorry. Seeing a moment here, sorry. <laughs> um, all these amazing artist. She attended the Newport um, Folk Festival three years in a row and sang at the festival. Um, uh, Joan Baez and Pete Seeger and all these people, they just loved her. They loved being on stage with her. She sang with Odetta and uh, Mahalia Jackson. She just, she was just amazing. She worked with Dorothy Height from the um, National Council of Negro Women and um, Hamer was so concerned about food insecurity that she conceived of an idea to buy um, uh, like 400 acres in Sunflower County and in other counties around Mississippi so that people could plant food so that they could have food in the times of year, where they, like the winter time. A lot of plantation owners insisted that people plant cotton right up to their cabins and they didn't have their own patches to grow food to carry them through the winter. So she had this farm co-op and a pig um, exchange where they raised pigs, they gave pigs to families who could raise them, have litters, slaughter some of the pigs for the season, and then give the, 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 the baby piglets back to the food co-op and the pig pet farm, and they would have them for the next year. So Dorothy Height helped raise tons of money for that uh, effort too. Hamer ended up um, joining with Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan and Shirley Chisholm here um, and uh, Bella Abzug and others to start the, um, the National Women's Political Caucus and um, they fought for the ERA. Now interestingly, Hamer was a very conservative feminist, very conservative. Later in life, she was, even though a lot of these young women were fighting for reproductive rights, uh, the right to have an abortion, and um, to have access to birth control. And um, Hamer was against that. She was against abortion and she was against birth control, which I find really interesting that she was against birth control. Uh, the abortion issue, I understand given what she went through. However, when she was a younger woman, she helped facilitate 
women getting access to, birth, to abortions. So it, it's sort of typical of, not typical, but there were women who go through lives and by the time they're older they change their minds. Um, that she had seen also the, the terrible side of abortions. But the birth control thing still confuses me. I'm not quite clear on that. So the civil rights movement sort of in the 60s petered out and all those young SNCC people, some of them became very radical, joined the Black Panthers, and they, uh, they left Hammer behind. There were meeting minutes that I read during my research, and some of the very young SNCC activists were complaining Hammer was too old. They, they didn't want to work with her anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, you know, they were just, and she was so positive and, and supportive. She's like, I get it. I get that I'm older than they are. They've got to go find their way. They have to fight their own way. So they kind of pushed her out. So she did more local work, and she would still go and give speeches around the country and raise money for the movement, but it was different. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. So um, by the early 1970s, she was, she'd was she always been sort of sick throughout this whole period after the, the, uh, the, the beating. But by the early 70s, she had a lot of health problems and exhaustion. Thank you. And she, um, she suffered from diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, kidney disease, and, um, and she ended up with breast cancer. And so access to health care was a problem, and she didn't have the money to pay for good health care. So she <laughs> suffered quite a bit um, as she aged. There were certain people that maintained contact with her, like John Lewis and others, but she drifted, or they, the new movement drifted on with, without her. Um, I love this picture of her. So she died uh, from complications of breast cancer in March of 1977. I love this picture with her family and friends. Um, it shows the joy that she had most days and why people were so attracted to her. Um, so she was 59 years old when she passed. And I just, it's so, such a regret. What more could she have done if she had lived a lot longer? And I still think today, what would she think of what's happening today? So shortly thereafter, the work that she had done um, at the convention in 64, the passing of the Voting Rights Act in 65, by 1970, about 60% of African Americans um, who were eligible to vote in Mississippi could vote. <clears throat> so the, the progress was happening. Um, African Americans were being voted, uh, were elected into office in the state. But I think today, what would she say about what's happening? Sometimes I think she wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, she'd probably be pretty angry. <laughs> but I think there's so much there that we need to celebrate about a Fannie Lou Hamer. She's that type of leader who came out of nowhere, who didn't have all the advantages that so many of our leaders today have, fabulous education, financial resources, incredible networks. She didn't have any of those. It was just this raw talent that was recognized, supported, and elevated. And I think there are people like Fannie Lou Hamer in our communities today. We need to recognize them, support them, and elevate them. Because we can't all be Fannie Lou Hamers. But there are people like her that can help change the world. So thank you. So any questions or yes? Um, PBS has been advertising. I guess next week they're going to have a show right. about yeah. her, but I haven't yeah. been able to yeah. catch the date and time. So it's next week, and it's called um, Fanny Lou Hamer's America. And it's not a typical documentary. It doesn't have talking heads like a person like me on screen saying, oh, well, she meant this, she did that. It is like an hour of different clips of Fannie Lou Hamer speaking during interviews, on stage, singing. Um, in your own words. In her own, it's all her own words. It's all her own. The 22nd. Oh, oh thank you. Yeah. PBS. Yeah, PBS. Yes. Yeah. And Monica Land is a uh, a Hamer relative who started working on this I think in 2004 and slowly 
pulled it together and now it's finally being aired. So I'm excited to see it. I saw a rough cut last winter and it was it was it was stunning. She just brings all these clips together. They flow so beautifully together. Some are in black and white, some are in color, some singing. And you'll see her intensity. She's so intense. And the older she gets, the less compromising she is. She's so demanding. Because she'd been through so much, it was like, you know, people have to hear, they have to listen. So it, it'll be good, it'll be really good. Yes? I think that you've presented an excellent uh, program this afternoon. Yeah, very good. Really and I'm a Thank little you. bit, uh, it brought back a little bit of anger mm -hmm. and a lot of sadness when I see what's happening today. Because everything that they've gone through and all the lives that were lost, they're trying to erase history yeah. and not show, I'm not saying you can't love your country, but you're unpatriotic if you if you question things that right. happen. And every country has flaws. But I think that um, I had a lot more hope in the 60s. You know, even though there were a lot of things happening, I find that as I grow older, I'm beginning to lose that hope mm -hmm. because I see there are so many people that are for things going backwards and not erasing history. Right. And so that saddens me. So, and, you know, when I did this research, this was brutal research. This is, this is not attractive history at all, and it's very hard to tell. And I, you know, I, I don't want you to walk away thinking that Fannie Lou Hamer was upset and ter miserable every day. She was not. And she was determined not to hate. She was determined. She, she used her anger for change rather than striking out at people. And what she... I'm going to take a cue from her. She believed in young people so strongly, even when they rejected her. And I have to believe that young people today are going to make a difference. Their, their world is very different than some of these folks that are trying to bring us back to the 60s. Their worldview is different. And if they can be empowered, I think, you know, I have to have, I have, to have hope. I've got little grandchildren. I've got to have hope. <laughs> I really do. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I just want to say that thank you so much. That was wonderful yeah. how you did that. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I believe it was through her Christian faith that brought her through. Mm -hmm. Because that, um, my mother was born in 1942. And um, now that she's passed away, it's her third year anniversary, January 21st. And, um, you know, I was the only child, and I felt the sense of entitlement. Uh -huh. Both my parents were very well to do. Uh, my mother ended up um, coming to Massachusetts in um, 51. And uh, she she had a sixth grade education. She had picked pot herself, yeah. and she was there for. And she told me the story how she had a can of beans and a piece of salt pork to carry her through the week. Yeah. So that I wouldn't understand what she had went through, and I didn't want to hear any of that. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. On the house, we were the first black people on the house in Old Mills. Oh my, my goodness! Wow. Mm -hmm. And um. So you experienced a lot of you know yeah, Massachusetts was not a haven of. I was born yeah. in '61. And I had an aunt that lived in Roxbury, and her and her husband were drunk, and they loved me so much they would take me on the weekends. And I'd be outside on the fire hydrant at five o'clock preaching. I would be They were preaching about black, you know, rights and black people and God and whatever. And I'd be out there, you know, on Warren Street, you know, down there. <laughs> That's and great. I, and, um, so, anyways, I just want to say that. Um, now that I'm reflecting back on the fact that my mother was born a little bit after slavery, um, and uh, my great grandparents raised her, who were part of slavery, and I always thought my mother was from Savannah, Georgia, but my mother's from a place called St. Helena Island, oh, yeah. which is um, Route 95, the end and the beginning, it's one way in and one way out, yeah. and I lost a lot of that land because um, my great grandfather couldn't write. So when he died of starvation with this woman who had 12 kids who put an X on the D. And the slave master Simmons had left him all this land. And I remember going there and going in the shack. And there's a square hole in the wall where my mother climbed in to sleep. Uh -huh. We didn't have any electricity or anything. Uh -huh. We didn't running water and everything. And um, he had two, uh, acres and acres and acres and acres. It took us over a day. That he, so the Simmons was a huge... So your people are Gullah. Gullah people? Yeah, yes. 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 Yeah. Right. yeah. And um, so that's why they call Skeechee Gullah. Yeah. And um, because um, when my mother passed away, it wasn't even two weeks after she passed, 
that I kept seeing things on TV that talked about Swarthmore County and Savannah. Wow. And then there was a documentary on St. Helena Island. Oh. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> so I called a cousin of mine who, um, all my so-called cousin, because my mother was an only child, so really, you know, these people are who you should go with. But um, I called her and I said, I just got done watching this documentary with this lady named Mrs. Green, who has all her grandkids from all over the world, staying with them, helping them do chicken cane, and they don't want to. They all want to go back home to New York and Chicago. And she said, oh, I just left her house down the road. Uh, so I go, what? And so they have this harvest, this festival in November with the fresh crabs and shrimp and stuff, and they're in all, like if you, I, I don't have mother and sisters, my mother didn't either, but I actually would have kept some of this land because somebody would have been there to help tend and collect because it was all secure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of wonder that my, um, my mother's half brother sold to, to, to pay taxes and so this woman to take off with everything and now she sold a lot of the property idea. So um, all my cousins, there was 12 kids in one family and the mother died at the last birth. They all came to Boston and drove to uh, the MBTA. And Helen, she worked at, um, in West Roxbury as a probation officer. So they all just retired, went and built their houses and went back down. And my aunt Mabel, who worked for the post office all her life, she had the double trailer, three bedrooms. In her mother's house right next door. So, so all, you're all returning to the. So what I'm saying is that just to just to um, not even, just to acknowledge Black history, Black history for me is looked at every day. Now that my mother is gone, when I think about what she's gone through and how I took it for granted, yeah, it, it really hurts because she had to pick that cotton with a with a steel hand from my great grandfather who was over six feet tall laughing in her shirt and wore a white shirt every day. And the parents would come in at the middle of the night and measure his land. And he would start shooting his rifle and tell him he could get off his property. And he promised me not to sell the land. You know how they go. Yeah. And um, they come and take all his rifles and he'd walk 10 miles to town every day, every other day, to get his rifle. Yeah, because they couldn't keep his rifles. It was they against the law. They, 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 yeah. they, they knew what to do with this. And this being from West Africa, yeah, because that's where um, that part of um, South Carolina they, they let off people off the ships down there. We were West African, so now I, I'm actually learning who I am and where I come from. And I used to, I was a nurse for many years and um, working in a hospital in the shop. It used to kill me to hear people talk about going home on their vacations to Ireland or different places because they had some place to belong. But I really didn't have a place to belong because my mother didn't have any brothers and sisters. And I didn't know how to do, I didn't know anything about any of this. But needless to say, I have my history not straight. Right. Because I'm thinking she's from Savannah, Georgia. All I knew was Swarthmore County. That's the county where my grandfather, big grandfather had. He had owned all of that. All that land by the water. It's beautiful. The crabs and everything on your feet. And uh, just to say, I lost all that because I didn't know. And the fact that um, there were LLCs and all these things, I mean, it was like, I got on TV in my face. I was like, what the heck? What did I miss? I should have been, I should have been out here partying. You know, like, you know, yeah, that's what was happening. You know, I was running the street, being rebellious, instead of paying attention, which she wasn't really talking much about because she had a lot of anger and misguided stuff as well. That's right. She never wanted to go back. Right. And when she came all the way to Massachusetts as, one of the first, what was it, 2,000 people standing in line from Echo Candy Factory on Mass Ave by the uh, MIT to get her job. Yeah. And um, yeah. she got a job. Echo Candy. Yeah, Echo yeah. yeah. Candy Factory. Mm -hmm. And um, she was crossing the street one afternoon, going home, down the South End. They just came black people from the North into the South End after we had done all that work, as, as I hear the history. And, um, and my dad was standing there in his uniform. And he said, hey, girl. And then I was born. <laughs> well, if I if I could just um, bring you back to the history, yeah, okay. so yeah, a lot like, of people, yeah. I am involved so deep that her story is not much different from my mother's That's story. That's exactly. Even though she, my mother didn't have the, the time, and she didn't have to go out there and do that. And she didn't, did, yeah, she didn't. She stay. did it for her. Right. She did it for us. Right. Right. And also, amazing. but now the fight now for different school systems to oh, continue God. to teach this because young people are yeah. learning this history, 
Um, and a lot of community, like even in Mississippi, they just voted to change the, the K through 12 standards and to take Fannie Lou Hamer's name out of the lessons through eighth grade. After eighth grade, they insert it back. So there's a huge uproar now in Mississippi, like, why are you taking her name out? So, uh, you know, there is backlash, and that's a good thing. It's people are, are fighting. And this history, and, but all, and the other thing about black history is a lot of people have this belief that, um, like, you can't know your family history because, oh, before the Civil War, you know, there are no records. There are so many records. It's like this big scam on people of color that you can't trace your history. You can't. Everybody, it, it's there, and we need to learn it. This is a shared history, and it's important. And it's um, it's powerful, powerful history. It's really powerful. And I, you know, so this is why I get inspired by Harriet Tubman and Fannie Lou Hamer, and even Rosemary Kennedy, who lived with a disability and inspired her family to change this world. So people with disabilities have access. You know, the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's why we have ramps everywhere now, and and access and bars and bathrooms and things because the Kennedy family. Those kids, they saw their sister suffer, and they changed the world. So we, we can teach all of our history through the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Harriet Tubmans and the Rosemary Kennedys of the world. Yes? Um, you had mentioned the sharecroppers weren't allowed to raise food, just cotton. And some people may not be aware of the plantation system that was post-war. There was a reason for that. You had to go to the company store to buy your canned right. tomatoes and your canned beans. And you got further in debt. Right. In debt. The whole idea was you could never leave. Right. Because it was you debt pay in right. debt. Right. Even if you had a bountiful cotton crop, yep. you still bought your bacon at the company store, yeah. your eggs at the company yeah. store. That's three times the price of it where you could get it elsewhere. Of debt. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, have obviously lived through and studied this mm -hmm. period. I wasn't aware of the uh, sterilization, but folks should know people of color are still being sterilized against yes. their will, including in the detention camps in Texas for undocumented women. Oh, right, right, women. right. Yeah. They've discovered quite a few of these young women were not aware that they've been sterilized. Right. Right. on their trips to the friendly medical people. So it was outlawed a lot in this country yes. in 1973. That's <clears throat> like what and the heck? Why was it ever you can illegal? Outlaw anything. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming right. murder in this country has been outlawed since 16. <laughs> You're right. But it, it's stunning. It is but, stunning. Uh, all people of color have been mistreated through history. We're seeing now, um, even in the Olympics, the nasty comments about the Asian athletes, yeah. Yeah. Um, as if they're individually responsible for us wearing our masks. Uh, so everything you've done today is important for everyone who didn't know everything. I like to think I know a lot, but I didn't know that aspect of it. And it's very, it's so crushing to know that that can be done to people. Yeah. Um, I read a, I led a book discussion group about Henrietta Lacks. Oh, right, right, right. Um, mm -hmm. The history of uh, particularly violence against black women yep. um, oh, has yeah. been kind of underneath. Yeah. We, well, they killed Martin and they killed um, all of these important people, right. but they crushed the souls of countless black women and other women of color. And the, and the, and the sterilization, actually, um, the SNCC workers, the civil rights the group, SNCC, went into Ruleville and that county and tried to get testimony from other women who had been sterilized by that doctor. Yeah. But so many of them were afraid to sign their statements because of the retaliation. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't bring charges against him. But it was happening throughout the South and in Appalachia and where other in other poor communities, poor white women were being sterilized against their will too. It was just women in prison were being sterilized. It's, it's just horrifying. That was a lot. Before this started, me and you were talking about the Newport cigarettes, how 
of it's targeted to black people before they took away the health. Yeah. No cost for that. Right. So, yeah. You had a question? Yeah, I was just <coughs> wondering. Do you want to bring up what happened on the news yesterday and today with the two cops? I, I so uh, my daughter just had a white man. Oh, I didn't see that. I I was home taking care of my grandson, so I didn't watch the news. Another one? What happened yesterday? What happened? What I wasn't aware of what happened. They had the footage. I don't know about the body cam or the security. But there was a fist fight between two teenage boys. They and when the police were called in, because the dog kind of blurring, what they did was they kind of pushed the white kid aside. He's on a couch. Oh, he yeah. actually got a chance to run away. They 14 year old black boy was uh, was pinned down, handcuffed, just like. Yeah. And, like, and let's just say they're going to have a hard time explaining oh, that one. Oh, well, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so this is hard history. It's yeah. the truth and. Uh, it's still happening. I know. Like, yeah, but we, you know, we just have exactly. we just have to stand up and, and, right, and just stand up and you know tell the truth and demand that actually we the, this country fulfills the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all people are created equal. Yes. I just want to make a comment. I made the quote from oh. talking front to back, and I have been so enlightened. I was taught in school, which was nothing. Mm -hmm. And reading about her and reading, she, I was in tears reading what the whole thing was. I think that this is something that I never knew. Yeah. No, well, no. I went to school and I went to me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.